All right, um, I'm just gonna get started with the introduction and as more people trickle in. Um, good afternoon, my name is Kayla Marino and I'm with the Virginia SBDC Network. For those of you that are not familiar with our organization, the Virginia Small Business Development Center is a partnership between the United States Small Business Administration, George Mason University and local host institutions throughout Virginia. With 27 locations across the Commonwealth, we provide training and technical assistance to small businesses in their local communities. Uh, our one-on-one -on -one consulting services are available at no charge. Um, today's webinar, Understanding Complexities of the Global Supply Chain, is presented by the Virginia SBDC Network. Um, also, we are recording today's uh, presentation and it will be posted on our website, virginiasbdc.org. Due to the large number of participants, everyone's microphone is muted, but if you have any questions during the presentation, you can type those into the Q&A box. Um, we also have enabled the live transcription function, uh, which you can show or hide via your meeting controls. Um, and now it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today's session. Uh, Evelyn Suarez provides legal and consulting services to companies engaged in international trade, particularly related to customs, anti-corruption, and trade policy. Aaron Miller is the director of the International Business Development Program at the Virginia Small Business Development Center at George Mason University. Uh, Dulce Zonheiser is a senior international trade specialist at the Virginia SBDC, where she specializes in helping companies enter the international marketplace. And Chris Van Orden is an international trade specialist at the Virginia SBDC uh, at George Mason. And he supports Virginia exports with a particular focus on the food and beverage industry. Um, so please join me in welcoming our panelists for today. Thank you so much, Kayla. And we'll jump right in. I know time is short here, so I'm going to share my screen um, and we'll get started with some of our slides here. Um, of course, it's not. Okay. Um, so thank you so much, Kayla, for um, setting the table here for us. Uh, as she mentioned, my name is Aaron Miller. I'm the director of the International Business Development Program uh, at the Virginia Small Business Development Centers. We're excited to have our uh, partner, Evelyn Suarez, who uh, runs her own uh, law firm, the Suarez Firm, out of her home in Washington, D.C. And uh, today we're, you know, want to provide this content for um, a pretty wide uh, and diverse audience. Uh, really what kind of sparked this idea for this specific webinar was that all of the issues that Main Street and um, consumers are having as it comes, as it relates to, you know, being able to get their products or uh, it, and their market and helping to really understand what, it, what are the, um, what are the, what is the context of these supply chain issues that we're facing right now? So um, it's really, uh, you know, we'll touch on some things around international trade for sure, because this is um, a, a topic that is greatly influenced by global supply chains. It's not just what's happening in America, it's happening all over the world. Um, so we'll, we'll definitely be looking at it from an international trade perspective, kind of addressing some of these more uh, basic um, concepts in international trade and supply chain issues, um, and then offering some concrete recommendations about what small businesses can do going forward on that. Uh, feel free to use the Q&A function during this time. Uh, we will uh, be monitoring that and taking questions mostly at the end, um, but if there are some questions that are relevant that we can get to at the moment, we'll do that as well. Um, just quickly on the background of the international business development team, Dulce, Chris, and myself bring over 40 years of experience in international trade. We provide no-cost uh, counseling for businesses of all sizes that are based in Virginia that are looking to expand 
internationally or if there are um, challenges that they're presented with that we can help them overcome those. We really focus our services um, in addition to supply chain and trade finance, um, as well as marketing and management. We're supported by a terrific team of George Mason University students who provide customized market research for Virginia companies as well. So we hope that you, you know, if you haven't worked with us directly yet, um, that you uh, reach out to us and we can set up a time to, to speak and see how we might be able to assist you. So I'm gonna kick things off um, and we're gonna start with the basics so that we're all on the same page. And Evelyn brings an um, incredible background in uh, customs and international trade and specifically around supply chain issues. So Evelyn, I'd like to just kind of start with you and maybe you can help us understand some of the basics and you know what really is in, what is entailing of a global supply chain. Well, Aaron, thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and um, yes, I think uh, we all agree that it was a good idea to start with um, a common understanding of what a global supply chain is. It, a global supply chain is by its very nature international. Uh, it is, as this definition, this good definition says, a network of manufacturers, port facilities, transportation and logistics companies that make products uh, throughout the world. Sometimes they're finished products, but some other times there are materials and inputs. In many cases, there is multi-country processing. So you don't necessarily have a finished product going from point A to point B. In the customs world, this creates some issues for determining what is the true country of origin. A classic example uh, of uh, multi-country processing and global supply chains is uh, maybe your iPhone your, uh, or your smartphone. Uh, and that's true with the, in the electronics industry parts. There's work done in China, but there's also work done in other countries in Southeast Asia. And they may, you know, there's, there's work done in many countries. Um, so, um, there are, those are global supply chains. There also has been the development of regional supply chains. And um, I think many of us are probably familiar with the North America, with North America, uh, with the NAFTA, which is now the USMCA and how it established uh, a regional supply chain, especially for the automotive industry and automotive parts. Okay, Aaron. Thank you, Evelyn. Yeah, and we're going to get into some of the specifics on uh, different sectors as well. But why don't we go to kind of a, a visual uh, here that goes into a little bit more detail. And again, to you, Evelyn, can you maybe start off by giving us a definition of, you know, what is intermodal transportation and you know, how does that fit in the global supply chain as well? And what are some of these choke points that we're talking about? Okay, there are two things really. One is, uh, you said the inter intermodal uh, transportation system. And then the sec second thing is the sh choke points, choke points in the freight system. Uh, the first uh, thing you see there is an import container and an import container is not a choke point, but it's kind of an enabler. It's an enabler of, it was an, an, an enabler of, I can't talk today, of, um, of globalization. It was um, developed and operationalized by a North Carolina truck driver, Malcolm McLean in 1956. He started it by putting a box on his uh, truck and then moving it to a ship. And they, uh, they actually did a first test run between Elizabeth, New, New Jersey and Houston. That, that led to uh, the formation of a company called Sealand. Uh, the, you know, that, and that, with that, uh, we see the uh, development of the box. Um, so in terms, so, um, this slide actually uh, shows a lot of the places, which we will talk much more about these, uh, the, the issues involved in the crisis, the global supply chain crisis. 
but it shows nicely the various choke points for an import container that carries goods around the world. The first is um, the, the ports, uh, and many of you've seen, we've all seen many pictures of all those ships lined out the port, ports of LA and Long Beach. What happened uh, recently was that there was an unanticipated uh, increase in the demand for consumer goods and consequently we had a lot more imports. These, uh, this surge in imports um, strained uh, the system and it strained uh, the, uh, the carriers and the ports. But, um, but there is, um, there, you know, there are other choke points because uh, the, the container moves, it you know, typically moves from the terminal to warehouses, uh, but it, it has to get there by some means and it probably would get to the rail, to the warehouse by truck or rail. And there's all these become choke points. One uh, choke point that this slide does not depict is really customs. It's a natural choke point. And so this is something that we'll talk about later, but, but that's something because it's their regulatory requirements that need to be met. It doesn't necessarily hold things up at the border, but it can. Uh, then there's also issues with another possible choke point is warehouses if they're full. And then, um, so, uh, you know, it goes on and on. Um, so, um, uh, anyhow, um, as, as the pandemic, um, okay, I think that's about it for here. Sure. Well, thanks, Evelyn. And Dulcie, maybe you want to um, chime in here. What are some of the unexpected strains that the supply chain has experienced? And, you know, maybe the ones that aren't as obvious or, or as descriptive on this slide here. Thanks, Aaron, and, and I'm delighted to be with you all today. Um, I think one of the things, and Evelyn gave a very good description of, of, of the supply chain from the pop it in the box to get it to where it needs to go. But one of the things that we need to think about with the supply chain is that it's bigger than just transporting things. It is um, not only uh, uh, putting something in a box, but you have to make something before you can get to that stage. So um, we wanna look at um, everything from the inception, from the procurement of raw materials, the research and design all the way through to the delivery to that end user or that buyer. And one of the things that we look at when we're looking at that supply chain is not only the transportation side of it, but we're also looking at labor. And we're looking at labor from not only the transportation side, but from the manufacturer side, from the trucking on the on the ground, maybe at the in the in the country of, of origin, um, getting the 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 rarers out of the ground or the minerals that are required out of the ground to make that battery to go into that into that cell phone or whatever. Um, so we want to look at it from labor, transportation, raw materials, um, and we want to look at some of the pressures that may be placed on, on those things. Obviously, the pandemic put an awful lot of pressure on labor throughout the, the supply chain. Um, you know, people did get sick. Uh, people were waylaid. Uh, facilities were shut down for a host of reasons, um, and many of them being related to labor. But we also had things like lightning strikes happen at oil refineries. We've had things like the deep freeze in Texas. Um, supply chain isn't just an international conversation, it's a domestic and an international conversation. Um, we also find things like, you may be able to make that sports drink that we all love and drink all the time, but if you don't have the plastic pellets to actually package that product, that makes it difficult for you to get your product to market. Um, and for instance, in, in China right now, there was an article in the Wall Street Journal several days ago that talked a lot about uh, the fact that the Chinese are experiencing a significant power uh, shortage. They are not able to generate enough power to keep factories operating and ports operating. And you do need power in order to, to go through the manufacturing process. So these are things that you think about and you look at as you're looking at your supply chain. What ports do you need to use? Are you something where you're using rail or highway? Um, is there a, a particular country of interest that you're sourcing from that may have extraordinary circumstances? Maybe they are affected by hurricanes or snowstorms. There are a lot of pressures that go on to a supply chain that are not immediately apparent to us because we often think, oh, the supply chain is 
pop it in a box, put it on a boat, put it on an airplane and get it to the end consumer. So we do need to look at, at the supply chain system as a much broader, almost octopus-like system um, that can help us get our products where they need to go. Thanks so much, Dulce. And staying with you, um, you know, as the pandemic, um, we hope will subside over the course of time and that vaccinations become more widespread, especially with our overseas uh, partners. Will some of these supply chain pressures subside at, at that time? Or do you think they're, they're here to stay? Are they, I guess what I'm asking is, you know, is this more of a short-term uh, issue that we're dealing with or temporary problem? Or, or do you see some of these issues continuing? I personally see these things continuing. I look at the supply chain from a much larger perspective, as I just described. Um, and I think that a lot of the economists are starting to agree with me. I mean, Moody's Analytics said that they thought it was going to get worse before it got better. Um, other economists, Goldman, has said that it's going to take many months to resolve the, the, the transportation side of this, let alone the access to some of the inputs that people are going to need. So I think it's going to take some time for the supply chain to catch up to um, the disruptions. Obviously, when we look at the infrastructure that's necessary to support the supply chain, those steps are going to take a very long time to do. If we need to expand our port facilities, if we need to uh, increase the size of our cargo terminals at airports, if we're looking at identifying um, different resources to put into our products, those things take an awful lot of time and sometimes they take permitting and sometimes they take an awful lot of planning. So I do think that that is going to prove to be um, a bit of a problem. Um, I was just online before this session looking at the latest log jams. And one of the problems that we've got is, well, yes, we have a lot of, of ships off port. Um, we have um, a warehouse problem. Um, we don't have enough capacity there. So you do have to look at all of the knock on things that you have to support um, to make it a stronger, a stronger supply chain. And, and I just don't see those things being resolved tomorrow. Um, and I think that we're, we're, we're going to have to um, weave and bob a little bit and probably get a little bit creative in order to address um, uh, the infrastructure side of things. But also, I mean, the consumer is not stopping. They're not stopping their buying. Their demand, the demand is up there. So um, I think it's going to continue to put a lot of pressure. We don't want people to stop buying. We don't want people to, you know, kind of go into, into halt mode. Um, but we may find that scarcities may, may, may slow demand a little bit as well. I'd like to add a few points, I, and I'll make it really brief. Um, I, I see it as a short-term problem and a long-term problem. There, um, I, I think that uh, they're saying that uh, demand is actually starting to slow down a little bit because the, the you know, the, but, uh, and I think the, one of the reasons I think it's a short term problem because as uh, we have more people vaccinated and there are less of the, the closures and the quarantines and, you know, we get work through these, uh, you know, the backlog, it, it's a short-term problem, but there are long-term problems. What the pandemic did was expose uh, weaknesses in our system, okay? And their infrastructure problems. I mean, there's been great investments in ports, but obviously we're talking about a big infrastructure bill right now. And so th th there obviously there needs to be, uh, you know, there, we also see weaknesses, there's not enough workers at the ports uh, the, and then they're skilled workers because many ports and most ports are highly automated. Uh, and then there's shortages of truck drivers today. There's a shortage of 80,000 truck drivers. There's not enough warehouse space, but there's also there's facilities so there's infrastructure issues. The other thing is uh, while we had a pandemic, we have other events that create uh, the, the create natural volatility in the freight system. And those, you, those are, you know, we do have seasonal trend, trends and peaks. And, you know, as they say, you don't, uh, you don't, you don't um, uh, arrange your infrastructure for Christmas and Easter, you know, you do it for the rest of the year and then you deal with that. But there are weather events, you know, we had, remember, we had you know, you can have an earthquake, a tsunami. There, there were typhoons very recently that'll have impacts. So we will continue to see this port congestion. 
We may see cybersecurity issues and the ports are very, you know, that's a very important issue for them. There can be geopolitical crises. So, um, and, you know, for, you know, they're warning us, this may not be the last pandemic. So, so it's a, it's a short-term problem that will probably ease, you know, and demand may continue, but it may not because there were years ago in 2008, we were um, begging people to buy stuff. So, you know, these things are cyclical. So, so that's, that's my two cents. Thanks, Evelyn. And I think, you know, we've seen a lot more um, black swan events a lot more frequently than perhaps we've uh, would expect over a short period of time. So, um, and that's in addition to the regular kind of cadence of these seasonal demand uh, issues. There's a question here, and, and let me know if you want to um, answer this later, but we have a question around uh, the lack of warehouse space near ports as one of the contributing factors in our supply chain woes. Um, does that warehouse space include intermodal FTZs or is the expansion of intermodal FTZ a potential solution? Uh, do you want I, me to take that or do you want to take it? I, well, I, I, I just, I don't think there's a silver bullet uh, and an FTZ is, you know, just a dedicated space and you have to go through regulatory uh, hurdles to establish one, to get a grant, et cetera. I mean, there's FTZs, they're bonded. Where the, the problem is not enough space. I mean, yeah, space. Space. yeah. Uh, I, I don't think FTZ is going to, you just, you know, establishing an FTZ, and obviously that would take time. So there, you know, we're just talking about warehouse space. There's not enough place to put the stuff. So I'm, I, I'm not, you know, I don't know that that is. Also, do you want to add to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree completely with Evelyn. I mean, the FTZs are, are traditionally, um, you know, either inside the fence for major corporations or they're 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 relatively small. Um, you know, if, if it's a small entity that has one, um, and you're not entering the goods into the United States unless you unless you start drawing on those products, so it's they're going to fill up if you're going to utilize that as a, as a valve control. But one of the interesting things is that uh, the Port of Long Beach, and, and we have this on the East Coast as well, um, they've entered into an agreement with Union Pacific right now to um, actually take on intermodal. Uh, they're bringing rail, they're bringing uh, rail cars into the Port of Long Beach, loading them up, and then creating an intermodal distribution uh, or, or, or partnering center in Utah, where um, you know it's an inland, uh, it's an inland port facility to get the stuff away from the port and load it onto trucks and then distribute it regionally. We've got, uh, I think we've got one in South Carolina, one in Georgia, and, and now and the one in Utah as well. And so people are getting creative about how to um, uh, move move things away from the port so we can free up the space to to, to make uh, make make things run a little more smoothly. And I expect that those uh, types of facilities will come online more and more as we go. I think something people should know about foreign trade zones, first of all, that there's a general purpose zone where there are a multitude of um, manufacturers. There's also sub zones which are dedicated to one manufacturer, usually a big company. It's um, you have to get approvals. It has strict accounting uh, procedures because and it makes sense where you have maybe have an inverted tariff. Uh, because it, so it's a it's a complicated um, and, you know it, it's warranted in certain instances, but it's something you need to learn a little bit more about before using. Yeah, we could probably have a whole nother webinar just on utilizing the foreign trade zones here in in Hi. Virginia. Um, you know, uh, Evelyn, you had mentioned and previously about this this picture, which is kind of become you know ubiquitous with our supply chain uh, problems and that's the the visual of all of these ships off of uh, the coast of Los Angeles and and the Long Beach port um, and this is actually a screenshot that if you go to um, marine traffic.com you can see a live interactive uh, uh, view of the world of cargo vessels and passenger ships and and where they are in the point of their destination. Um, you can click on these little uh, green and blue ships to get information about where they originated and everything too. 
But Dulce, do you want to kind of uh, give us a breakdown about what is happening here in uh, Los Angeles and, and Long Beach uh, specifically and some of the congestion issues? Sure. Um, first off, uh, this is a snapshot in time. Uh, it was a couple of days ago uh, from the from the Long, Los Angeles and Long Beach ports at San Pedro Bay. Um, what we're looking at here are ships that are in motion, meaning they're they're coming or going, um, or they're anchored, or they're they're uh, they're basically stopped their engines. Um, so you've got everything in one snapshot here. Uh, the red the red arrows are are oil tank oil and gas tankers. Uh, the green arrows are cargo cargo uh, ships. The pink are are um, uh, pleasure craft, and the blue are cruise lines. And you can see that we have a high concentration of ships. Um, I looked uh, on the on the the chart this morning, and um, they are projecting there are somewhere around 105, 107 ships off the coast of Los Angeles and Long Beach right now, um, waiting to come into port. Um, 80 of those are container ships. The interesting thing is they possess about 500,000 container units, which um, Goldman Sachs projected to be about $24 billion in, in goods being imported into the United States. Um, I thought that was a kind of an interesting number because it really makes it, it very real. It makes it very, um, you, can, you, can, you can understand it when there are 500,000 container ships and $24 billion worth of goods. Um, but one of the things that's important to know is that um, if you were to look at this whole map, you will see a flow of ships going constantly. There have been rumors that everything has stopped. That is not true. Uh, you, you do have ships that are able to get in. They might be waiting a week or two. I think the average right now is 13.5 days to get into the Port of Los Angeles, the Port of Long Beach, and that's normally up to about a four-day wait if there's any wait at all. Um, you know, in the past, you might have four, seven, ten ships uh, anchored off the coast, and, and now obviously you've got multitudes of that. But I think it's really important to, to recognize that um, there, are, there are some alternatives um, but this is the largest port system in the United States. It takes, I believe, uh, 30 or 40 percent of all the cargo entering the country comes in. They have rail support. They have, they have truck support. But if they can't get that cargo out of the ports, if they can't undock the, un, un, uh, either unladen the ships or, or, or load them up quickly, they can't move the next ship in. Um, so it is, it is important. Also, it's important to note that they have taken on, um, I think someone earlier in the session um, talked about the fact that some of the ports have gone to 24 hour, 24 hour a day, uh, seven day a week uh, services. Um, that's all fine and good if you can find the kind of skilled labor that you need to get to get these ports um, moving. So that is something that um, if you don't load properly, if you don't unload properly, you can actually create a fairly large problem in a port where you might have a boat turn or something along those lines. So you do have to make sure that it's done well. And a lot of this stuff is automated as well. Um, but again, it's physical goods coming into the port. Um, we have talked a little bit about some of the, the ports along the West Coast that might be able to uh, support some of this cargo be a, a relief valve. Um, I know that some, some freight kit systems are now looking at the Port of Oakland to maybe start tapping into things, but many of the ports are too small. Um, I know that the Port of Jacksonville in Florida is now making uh, concerted efforts to shipping lines to try and get them to come east uh, to, to go through the Panama Canal to try and take some of this pressure off as well. Um, it's going to take a lot uh, for all the ports to support um, support uh, um, getting the cargo relief in. I know the port of, I believe it was um, Savannah, Georgia, uh, was backed up and is now opening up opportunities again. Um, but because Jacksonville is 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 ha has a lesser load, or Philadelphia, or, or Baltimore, or New York, um, they have to start moving things around. But as you know, or as you've learned in this session. The rail and the and the trucking lines then have to match up, so there's still going to be some discrepancies there. Um, I think that's all I've. I've Thank got. you, Dulce yeah. and, and Evelyn. Just for um, point of time, because we're um, yeah. I want about to halfway through, and and I want to keep us moving so that we can get to some of the um, suggestions okay. and recommendations. Um, but um, and and so this is really kind of a 
a big picture about some of the choke points that we are uh, facing. And I know we had a question in the Q&A as well about uh, truck drivers and um, that only uh, perhaps only U.S. citizens are allowed to drive into the ports and whether or not this will these these policies can be loosened given our our kind of crunch when it comes to truck drivers. But uh, Evelyn, why don't we have you uh, kind of give us the big picture and walk us through this. And then I know um, Chris has some uh, a practical um, uh, kind of game that we can, uh, that you can play at your own leisure about how these supply chain bottlenecks are, are happening. So Evelyn. I'll make it real quick, but I wanted to add something about ports. You know, the West Coast ports are, the larger ports are very overloaded, obviously. Oakland's a very large port, Seattle, et cetera. They're smaller ports, but they're not necessarily, necessarily well equipped. But I wanted to make a big pitch for the Port of Virginia. <laughs> which is a, a, it's a very big, uh, it's the deepest, widest port. Um, you know, New York, New Jersey is the biggest. Uh, Savannah is very big, but it was backed up. Uh, Virginia is handling things very well. It has a common chassis pool, and I'll talk about that. So it's a very good option uh, in addition to uh, Charleston, but it, it's a very good option. As to, this is sort of drilling down a little bit. Uh, on the anatomy of the crisis. We've covered a lot of this before, but this manufacturing whiplash, I think is an interesting concept because what we had, and it was like the pandemic was following us all over the world. You know, at the beginning we had closures and uh, manufacturing facilities in China and other parts of uh, Asia and there were quarantines and that backed up the supply of materials and goods, et cetera. There were disruptions in Mexico. Uh, it was a very challenging situation. And, and even today, you know, that, and then we have this uh, increased demand too now. Uh, so this manufacturing has had this wet whiplash at the source and also because of in, unanticipated demand. We talked about shipping volatility, uh, and um, that that you know we they didn't expect the carriers reduced actually their capacity because they expected a recession and we were headed for a recession but the increased demand made them ill-equipped to carry all the cargo. We talked a lot about ports. Ports can't unlay the cargo fast enough because of the other um, choke points that we just discussed. Um, and one of the things we didn't discuss was container dislocation. Uh, the containers are not in the right place. Um, and that's true for the chassis. The chassis are the, you know, what carry the containers with the trucks. And they're, they're, there's a shortage of both containers and chassis. Um, so, and then this, uh, talking about this dislocation, you probably, people have probably heard about this, that the North America faces a 40% container imbalance, meaning that for every 100 containers that arrive in the United States, only 40 are exported. So, uh, and then we've talked about trucker, trucking. Trucking is, uh, you know, we, um, there, at the beginning, there were actually a number of trucking, large trucking companies that went bankrupt. And that, um, that disrupted an industry that moves, and this is really impressive, 71% of US freight. So that was very disruptive. Um, there, there's congestion on rail, and that we've seen that at bottlenecks at rail yards. And we already talked about warehouse, um, warehouse that operating at full capacity. So that supply chain, the, all of those things cause, you know, is causing you not to see your product at Costco um, or you can't get the material you need uh, for, to make whatever you make. So I think that's, that's about it for me on this one. And I will say anybody who's interested in um, understanding this sort of manufacturing whiplash, uh, it's also called the bull whip effect. The NPR's Planet Money just did a story on this uh, last week, I believe it was. Um, there's a, somebody who's created an online game. It's called the beer game, um, which is basically to show how the imbalance of information um, between manufacturers, distributors, wholesalers, and retailers, and then eventually consumers um, leads to massive effects. So small changes, uh, you know, incorrect guesses on, on one end of the supply chain results in really large swings on the back end. So I'm going to put in the chat um, today, if you want to go follow that story, you can download the app and just see 
um, the sort of amplification of incorrect, you know, information along the value chain. There. Thank you, Chris. And we'll be hearing more from Chris on the strategy uh, side of this conversation here really shortly. But um, Dulcie, I wanted to, to turn to you um, because outsourcing, as we know, has really been kind of the, the MO for American business as they seek greater efficiencies in their supply chain. Um, and some industries are more um, dependent on outsourcing than others. Um, but how do you see this as kind of this business model is being strained and is it still here to stay or are we going to see more companies shift towards how do they develop a more resilient um, supply chain and bring some of that, that, that supply chain back here to America? Thanks, Aaron. Um, well, outsourcing, there will always be an element of outsourcing that is that is part of any kind of any kind of business model. And I think we need to look at this from both a, a interna an international perspective as well as a domestic perspective. I mean, logistics and distribution are going to be very hard not to outsource. Um, you, you know, if your distributor is buying something and it's going to be stocking something in a foreign market or in a market across the country, you're not going to stop that from happening. And you're going to have to be wedded to to um, uh, the supply chain and, and the logistics as, as, as part of that, as the part of that reality. Um, you know, one of the things that, that small businesses have, have done in order to outsource is, is to create efficiencies. Um, financial efficiencies, lower the cost of the product, um, try to get maybe better materials um, from a, somebody who's a particular expertise in, in finishing or contract manufacturing or, or packaging or whatever the case may be. Um, and what we're looking at right now is can small businesses evaluate that outsourcing activity and figure out where they can pick up strengths maybe closer to home or maybe they can bring something in house. Um, it is it is definitely and obviously e-commerce may may create an opportunity there with it with the distribution side as well. But when we look at at these four components, they are they are. Uh, important arteries into how a, how a business functions, but it may this circumstance that we're facing right now may force us to make changes and there, to really look at maybe modernizing our packaging, um, changing how and where we finish the product, um, and and more importantly, can they manufacture on site? Can they not manufacture on site? Because they're still going to be going to be um, uh, very wedded to wedded to uh, the raw materials maybe coming from elsewhere. We are aware of companies in, that are are operating in the United States now who are changing their manufacturing facility from from uh, a foreign manufacturing uh, activity into the United States. We we know of a couple of companies who are really dedicated to making a product you know very much made in America, but they're still going to have to get that product to market. So when you look at the outsourcing piece of this, look at it from kind of uh, your, your product is the heart and these items are a vein or an artery that are part of that putting that, making that product development function effectively. When you get a clog or maybe multiple clogs, you have to go in and take those, those clogs out in order to get efficiencies rebuilt. So people are going to have to get away from their comfort zone and really reevaluate where they can find uh, increased efficiencies closer to home, someplace where they can control that manufacturing process, that finishing process, that packaging. Um, and there may be other other um, inputs or substitutes that they may be able to deal with. Because if you're looking at 120, 80, 180 day delays, I mean, we know of manufacturers who are taking up to 20 weeks to get product. Um, is it actually going to be cheaper for you to make it at home? We don't, we don't know that, but I think that's where, where companies are going to start testing if outsourcing is still, is still part of their, of their, their business model. Thank you, Dulcie. And I think, um, you know, this, this conversation and, and around nearshoring, it's going to be with us for a while. Um, it is a strategy to mitigate some of um, these strains that business is experiencing, um, but it might be a little bit longer term, like you, you mentioned, and still um, we're not going to, it's not going to be without some of these stresses on the system. 
but you really set us up for well for our next um, kind of focus area. And I'm going to turn to Chris to get us started on, you know, what are some real strategies for mitigating this this uh, disruption and what you can do as a small business uh, right now. So, Chris. Sure. So, um, you know, some of these are going to be um, more intuitive than others. Um, it's still worth being uh, intentional about all of these strategies. So. Um, you know, it may not be a good fit. Every step may not be the right fit for a specific company, but it's worth weighing all of them as you're trying to deal with these issues. So first of all, forecasting or planning. So investing time and resources and methodical forecasting can result in more efficient sourcing. So you may be able to reduce your costs by hitting uh, minimum order quantities, uh, reaching quantity discounts, shortening your shipping timelines or avoiding costly last minute fulfillment. And I believe that uh, Evelyn's going to talk about the sort of uh, the timelines associated with uh, kind of sourcing and all of that, the just in time model. Um, pooled buying or transportation. So obviously everyone that's on here knows that they're not the only ones dealing with supply chain headaches. Um, your peers and competitors are encountering the same issues, which actually presents an opportunity to realize efficiencies through things like collective bargaining. So let's say you're in the market for some sort of standardized packaging that's used throughout your field. Uh, you can split a purchase with a peer um, and with a peer business and get better unit per unit pricing. Um, obviously, anybody who's done any kinds of sourcing knows that the more you order, the more the, the cheaper the per unit cost. Maybe you can make a bigger, bigger purchase purchase by combining uh, your purchasing power. Um, similarly, if you have a half a container load of some critical input to order, uh, you might be able to get to get to get better shipping rates by filling a container with another business rather than paying a premium for less than container load shipment. So just doing those kinds of small things, seeing what other people are doing in that space, trying to find efficiencies by um, sort of acting together to increase your stature. Um, vendor relations. So it's always help, helpful to have redundancies built into a supply chain. So you're not reliant on one single vendor, vendor for a critical input. But that said, um, when you are working with a supplier, uh, it helps to have a strong relationship. So um, you should consider asking them about their timelines and pinch points so that you can factor them into your own ordering protocol. You want to kind of have up to date current information about what their stressors are um, and go out of your way to be a good customer. So being seen as a good customer can make all the difference when suppliers are forced to make their own compromises and leave some clients purchase orders under or unfulfilled entirely. Um, they're going through the same headaches that you are. And so if you get prioritized among, uh, above other people, maybe you'll be able to fare a little better than others. And um, it, some of this now is you're not going to be optimizing you know, your, your supply chain the way you might have done previously, but some of it is remaining competitive. And that just means doing the best that you can given the, the current climate. Yeah. Um, oh, do you want me to continue? Okay. Um, well, the, we, I, I don't really love this phrase, inventory, inventory buffering, and it kind of connotes hoarding, and that's not really what I'm talking about. Um, what I, since the 80s, uh, business and international trade has been very oriented to something called just-in-time inventory practices. Uh, it's very, it, it was all about efficiency. But today, what we're learning and, and is that we need uh, some resilience, I mean, because we with these disruptions. And so what we're talking about is, is, is not just in time, but planning. And well, it goes back to what Chris was saying about planning and, and uh, being a little more flexible. And so you're going to have to, uh, the other, the other uh, you're going to have to probably um, order more parts, materials, et cetera, so you're not left in the lurch. Um, the other thing is that today interest rates are very low. So that is possible. Um, okay, so the second thing we were talking about, and it's very related to what Chris was talking about, is sourcing diversification. Um, uh, Dulce had talked about near, uh, near shoring or onshoring. Um, I'm kind of th more of the uh, opinion that um, uh, manufacturers and consumers are well, more like manufacturers are gonna be more oriented to diversification. It's not easy to move your supply chain. I saw that with the 301 tariffs when uh, USTR asked uh, uh, importers whether they could move their um, manufacturing to outside of China. It's not always easy. Some, you know, you have to have a proven 
vendor proven manufacturer. So there's a lot of options. Move it. Some stuff may stay in China. Some some may be made in Asia. Then there's North America. We talk about regional supply chains, and there's also some in the United States. So uh, sourcing diversification also reduces the risk of something happening in one place or country. There's, this is another, uh, something you've heard about probably yesterday, <laughs> demurrage and detention charges. Um, shippers for a long time have been very upset and complaining about these charges. Um, they are really charges for leaving the container on the terminal too long or not returning the chassis. They're charges that are imposed on the carriers, but the carriers pass them along to the shippers. So it's an extra cost, something that, uh, that, um, that the port is obviously very upset about and imposing surcharges, right? The port of LA, Long Beach, because they wanna move these, car these containers off, otherwise they can't unload the containers and this backup will never end. So that's something to look out for. Another uh, strategy for, I, I wanna talk about tariffs. Tariffs uh, in the recent years, there've been tariff, tariffs imposed on imports of, from China, many, many products from imp, uh, imported from China and also on steel and aluminum. This has been an extra cost, a very high extra cost because it usually is to the tune of 25% and um, it's inflationary. So there are groups that are advocating to, um, to do away the, with these tariffs because they hurt consumers and they hurt US manufacturers. Finally, customs, we put customs there because uh, as I said before, it is a choke point. Uh, it is a natural choke point. It's always a choke point because if you don't have your, you know, it may not, uh, you, your, your, your product could be held up at the border, but more likely customs can come back and ask you questions and it could you eat up a lot of your resources and can result in additional duties and also penalties. So what I'm, I, what I'm saying is don't add to your problems, have your compliance act together, make sure you properly classify your merchandise, declare the correct uh, value and country of origin. So I'll uh, hand it off to uh, whoever's next. I think it's me. Um, in terms of building and flexibilities, obviously, companies have to be more adaptable to the circumstances that they face right now, which means that they should plan ahead. They should not um, over promise and under deliver on, on delivery dates and, and making sure that their customers are, you know, managing that relationship with the customer, um, making sure that they're, you know, building and lead times on sourcing, making sure that they have a clear handle on on timing and that they communicate uh, communicate those those um, those those timings because I think everybody recognizes that we all have to be flexible. Um, obviously, budgeting, building in flexibilities in terms of budgeting, making sure that you have extra resources available for any any uh, any additional spikes, uh, pricing spikes or delivery delivery pricing spikes or something along those lines. But most importantly, I think what we're trying to encourage everybody to do is build in some contingencies. Um, and it factors into everything that Chris and Evelyn just talked about, making sure that you're looking at every component of that transaction and making sure that you have set asides, that you have just a little bit of wiggle room, um, and that communication can help grease the skids if there are problems with your customers and with, with, the, with your, the partners that you have in terms of building out that product. So I think that that's something to take into serious consideration, sitting down with pen and paper, looking at your model and trying to figure out how you can tweak things to build in flexibilities. Um, the other thing is um, transportation options. You know, a lot of companies are very wedded to sea, sea shipment, and we're all recognizing that it is taking much longer to get those products through. Air cargo is having challenges as well, but we are finding that while a more, it's a more expensive um, mode of transportation, sometimes you need that product and you need to be able to get that product quickly. So you have to work with your freight forwarder to see if you can maybe segment out a small portion of that essential product that needs to get to you quickly and put it on air cargo. Or maybe you are looking at something where you can look at intermodal between uh, truck and rail, or, or you pretty much need a truck in order to get anything on rail anyway, but um, there may be ways that you can, you can capitalize on alternative forms of transportation to get that product where it needs to go. Um, 
you know, if you are sourcing out of someplace like uh, Canada or Mexico and taking advantage of USMCA, or you're taking advantage of even CAFTA DR, the Free Trade Agreement with Central America and the Dominican Republic, you can actually employ truck and rail and air very effectively and get your product where it needs to needs to go. So um, I think sometimes those markets are a little um, underexamined by by companies. Uh, most people are looking at Asia. But um, those looking at those markets and using different forms of transportation may actually expedite getting getting essential products back to you in order to complete your 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 um, delivery to your customer. Thank you, Dulcie, and thank you, Chris and Evelyn too. And at the risk of being you know redundant, I think it really does come back to having realistic expectations and. As a small business um, at this time, when it comes to global supply chains, there's a lot of things that are out of your control that you will not be able to impact or influence. Um, and, and so the most important thing is don't make it worse, right? And Chris kind of uh, pointed to the importance of uh, maintaining strong relationships, which is really the lifeline of, of all business um, and getting business done. If you're impatient or lose your cool with a vendor, um, you know, we're hearing from businesses that they just will cut, cut that person out of, uh, out of it in future dealings if they can, right? Um, businesses, even ones that are doing well right now are having hard times bringing on and supplying new customers. So they're really prioritizing their existing customers and who is um, who has treated them well throughout the years and uh, and doing this. So be patient, you know, don't haggle uh, a whole lot over uh, price. Um, try and understand really where your, your partner is coming from and be realistic um, in that. And so I'm going to have Chris kind of take us home um, here with some really specific and actionable uh, items on how you can communicate this to your partners and your customers. So Chris. All right. Uh, thanks, Aaron. So um, these are communication strategies. We're not saying you have to necessarily throw your hands up and that there's nothing that you can do, but um, both sort of upstream and downstream, um, finding ways to, to kind of um, keep those lines of communication open, help people to understand the situation that's going on. Because just by virtue of being here today, you're probably more informed than a lot of other people that you're dealing with about supply chain issues. So trying to help people understand in a very, uh, what you're going through at the moment. So uh, number one is determine the appropriate level of transparency. How transparent are you willing to be up and downstream? So, um, you know, what you might be willing to share with your upstream suppliers might be different from your distributors and customers. So um, you're going to have different levels of forthcomingness with different audiences. Um, in general, customers are, want more transparency now. An Oracle study just said 59% of customers want more in, uh, transparency on inventory and 54% <laughs> want more information on supply chain issues than, than what they're getting. So here's an example of a restaurateur who basically put it out there, the price increases that they're experiencing. And you can see it's anywhere from double to three or four X, I believe in some of these. Um, so massive price increases. And this trying to head off people saying, oh, like, well, why are you instituting, uh, you know, a 10% increase on your prices? Like, well, our input costs have quadrupled. We're still trying to, to serve you. So that may not be for everyone. This is just, a, you know, an option that's out there. You can determine how, how willing uh, you are to share these kinds of things. But some people are um, in ways that they might not have been doing before. Um, the second point is uh, define your message and communicate it regularly. So be clear about what your expectations are, what would be prompting a change in how your business runs um, and how those changes are gonna be communicated. So being proactive on that front, setting expectations for people and what the message is going to be. Um, so that there should be proactive outreach ahead of any change um, before a change is instituted. Let's say you need to have a, a price hike in order to make your margins, um, put it out there a period of time before it goes into place. Um, there should also be, you know, the information should be updated throughout your organization. So you don't want somebody to be looking at an old price list um, that doesn't drive with the new price hike that you have to institute. So that can cause a lot of headaches. And then during that transaction, making it clear, you know, if somebody's going out and selling, explaining, hey, this is this is going to be coming down the line. This is happening now. 
is going to be instituted on your next order, something like that. So um, let's say if you need to inform your customers about a temporary discontinuation of a product due to the inaccessibility of a core component, um, you need to also say, well, how are uh, you going to be handling refunds if somebody places an order and you're not able to fill it? Um, if something goes out of stock, you're starting to see some companies have an automatic uh, like option that shows up for a notification. They can opt in to be notified when that uh, item comes back in stock and they get the first uh, right, of, right of first refusal to order it, let's say. You know, if it's a limited edition item, something that uh, is hard to come by, they get, to, they get the first notification when it comes back in stock. Um, the next tip is to communicate core issues throughout the organization. So this comes to your own team. Um, you have to really make sure that all decision makers, everybody on your team is aware of the key issues, how the rules are going to be impacted, and how to communicate with their specific uh, stakeholders. So you really need to make sure there's clear, accurate, and up-to-date information all the way through the organization. Um, it has happened, and it's unfortunate when uh, a sales team is going out and pushing a product that's been out of stock for a period of time. Um, that's not gonna do anybody any favors. They look bad to their customers. You look bad for not being able to fulfill that order. Um, you may wind up losing a customer as a result. So they need to know what can be sold when, and what quantities, um, and you might wanna then direct them to uh, steer their customers to alternatives. Say, we don't have product X, but product Y is comparable. It's slightly uh, less expensive. Maybe this is a good option to tide you over until the next time. Um, that's not always possible for a given company, but it's a good strategy just to keep people involved. Um, when you're thinking about what your communication strategy is, um, this is, you know, it's, it's helpful to look to your peers or trade associations. So this is uh, number four here. So um, you're obviously, like I said before, you're not the only one facing these issues. So there's nothing wrong with borrowing good ideas from your peers and competitors. Um, chances are somebody has already had to address these issues. Um, it, so if they've come up with, up with a great framing or a great message, there's nothing wrong with uh, adopting that for your own business. Um, you may also choose to align your company with a broader campaign. So for instance, trade groups, um, every industry is being affected right now. So trade groups might be coming up with unified messaging um, that you can employ and say, hey, our industry is being affected in these specific ways. Here's what we're doing to try and meet your consumer demand. Um, and if the fit is right, that could be something that you can stand up. So something that um, the SBDC network is doing sort of on the consumer side is the Shop Sooner campaign. The Iowa SBDC stood this program up. It's trying to get people to um, order you know, their, their, their goods further in advance because there, there are going to be delays and try to give um, producers more of a heads up so that there's just not a last minute crunch there's a seasonality, of course, around the holidays with consumer goods. Um, anything to do to kind of spread that out over time is going to help to reduce the, the crunch when the high season hits. Um, number five. So this here, we're talking about um, considering how and when to pass on costs. That's just the reality of things sometimes is that, you know, a company can't just absorb costs over and over again. Um, so there needs to be a strategy in place for how and when to do that. Um, again, that uh, defining message, you know, point number two, letting people know well in advance when a uh, price change is going to um, to be enacted. Um, you should also emphasize whether that price increase is going to be temporary um, or permanent, and you're already even starting to see people break them out. So some of the strategies when it comes to these things, you, if you're um, going to have a quote. So let's say you're uh, going out and trying to sell items and you're doing quotes for people. Um, one strategy to avoid having to uh, change the price on a specific deal is shrinking your quote window. So if you typically give 30 days, maybe you can give 15 days because that's as far into the future as you can look right now. Um, again, giving people an earlier notification so that um, they know, hey, in one month, this price is going to change. Maybe I need to order now, especially if you uh, are concerned about the availability of that product going forward. Um, this way you can move through existing inventory while you're waiting for the new inventory to come rather than having a crush all at once. And then finally, um, disruption sur surcharges on this front. Um, you're starting to see people actually break out price increases as disruption surcharges. So if you know that you have to uh, institute a 10% increase, but it's only due to supply chain issues, you're starting to see people um, apply surcharges that are broken out from the core cost. So it demonstrates that it's not a permanent price raise. And you can, again, if you wanna be transparent about that, that's something that you can put out there. Um, finally, this is the setting benchmarks for escalating response strategy. You know, Every company needs to have 
um, an internal plan for uh, how they're going to react to these supply chain headaches. So the first step, and I'm sure every company that's here has had to do this, is absorbing costs. Um, sometimes there's a, you know, you're, you're uh, just have to compromise a little bit on your profit margin. That's just the reality of things right now. The next step is to pass them on. We talked about some strategies for doing that. Um, this can be painful, but that's everybody's kind of uh, forced to do that now as well. Um, sometimes a company will determine, hey, I need to alter my product line because what I'm offering right now, some of them, I just can't be profitable in certain products or certain channels. So I may need to make significant adjustments to what I'm offering, just say this item is discontinued until we have the availability of a certain input. And finally, the most drastic step is pivoting the business. So maybe uh, the sort of uh, distributed model of for somebody may not make sense anymore. Maybe a direct-to-consumer model that reduces the overall audience but preserves margins might be the way to go until uh, you know, you're able to reduce your costs enough to, to go into a distributed model. That just might be the reality. So figuring out what the benchmarks are for that escalating strategy, communicating it throughout, and just knowing, okay, we've hit that point where we're just not able to make money at this stage. We actually we'll move on to the next step. So those are just some general strategies for kind of communicating and dealing with these realities here. Thank you, Chris. And a lot of um, practical wisdom in there. Uh, these aren't silver bullets or, or instant solutions to the problem, but um, things that, that companies can, can start to apply today and hopefully overcome some of these issues. Um, we have now uh, kind of come up to the end of our uh, webinar. There's an evaluation here that you can um, fill out. Um, we're also able to stay a little bit extra here to take any questions that you might have um, along the way. So I'll just start with um, some of the ones that were in our chat, if um, that's okay. And uh, Evelyn, I know you're really well positioned to um, answer this one on the difference between a roll on and roll off and lift on and lift off shipping and the efficiency of each. Okay, well, there's special purpose vessels, uh, a roll on, I'm more familiar with the roll on roll off. Uh, they're really they're really good. like they're used for car carriers uh, so they're not used for containerized shipping uh, for example uh, ports that in the east coast that handle railroads are generally baltimore does a lot of railroad business so does brunswick georgia lift on lift off i'm less familiar with but they have a crane on board it's not characteristic they're usually a special purpose vessel i've worked with some shipping lines that had they weren't a shipping line they were like really special purpose for, the, for under MSC contract for the military uh, carrying very specialized cargo and it has cranes on board. So it's a lift on, lift off, but it's, um, it's, it's different. It's not what's used to carry all those containers. Those container ships are not like either one of those. Thanks, Evelyn. Um, Another question um, was, where are the opportunities for small business as a result of all of these issues? I don't know if, if um, Dulcie, if you want to jump in on that. And... <clears throat> That's a big question that probably the whole panel could, could jump in on because we all have probably different perspectives on it. Um, obviously, you know, when you've, when you've got a small business um, and you're providing a service, there, there may be ways that, depending on your business, um, that you may be able to capitalize on things. But um, I think that, you know, near markets is definitely, um, maybe people should be looking to, maybe you're only selling to Eastern Europe right now. Maybe there's an opportunity for you to take advantage of um, some of our closer, closer neighbors in terms of foreign markets. Um, in terms of sourcing, um, there may be opportunities there. Um, I think it's, it really depends on, on the business. It depends on the market. It depends on the end use. Um, uh, it, it's, it's really, um, this is a really challenging time. And I think that a lot of people are going to be looking at their business models and trying to figure out where they can maximize their opportunities and, and where they can't. It's not apparent to me what your particular business is or, 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 or what you do. So I don't, I don't know, but 
For instance, I know um, for companies that have um, uh, particular, they, they source from particular markets. Uh, I, I know, um, you know, maybe there's something that you can only buy in West Africa or in, in South America because that's where your product, your raw material is grown. It's going to make, you know, you, there's, there's not much you can do. There's not much wiggle room. So um, I think it really matters that people sit down with pen and paper and figure out where, where they think their pressure points are and where they can release that pressure. I have a, a, a comment on this one because I've worked with small businesses that get involved in the global supply chain and they import products. Um, what, what sometimes goes wrong and really turns them off to international trade is not being prepared. And therefore, like for example, they don't know that the product that they're importing is subject to an anti-dumping order of 160% of the value of the good. And they seem cool, you know, or they don't know that, um, you know, they have the wrong tariff classification and then it brings them into a provision that has an anti-dumping duty or something. So being prepared, um, get your ducks in the row, uh, all in the row, you know, instead of like, oh my God, customs called me and I don't know if I did this right. Uh, so we said that before, don't add to your woes, but if you're prepared, you know, you, it could work for you. So I just, I'm just going to do your homework a little bit. Great. Um, Tony Canvas, who is a, a colleague and, and partner from Mississippi, and a former customs um, official and customs broker uh, had the comment of that this was uh, interesting how this will impact calculation of VAT and customs duties in countries where customs uses CIF. US has reconciliation when final value details are unknown, but most countries in his experience do not. Evelyn, do you wanna add anything to? About other countries? Well, with, um, most countries are signatories to the GATT valuation code and they should accept what they call transaction value, which is the price paid or payable. Uh, but, you know, and then there's certain additions and exclusions, you know, so, um, you know, that's an observation, but, you know, I, um, we'll see what happens in the future. I don't think that should be included in the value, dutiable value, right? All right. Well, thank you all for um, your questions. I think we've we've kind of um, gotten to to the end of them. If there are no other questions, we'll just um, thank you. You'll have a uh, this will recording will go out to you. You'll be able to also find it on our website uh, along with these slides. Uh, feel free to to reach out to us and connect if you are. Um, in need of some additional services, and we're happy to, to meet with you. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye. Thank you.